Good night. Uh, this is the second uh, lecture that I've recast from spring of 2018. We'll use it this fall in 2019. And uh, I want to mention some of the practice questions that you'll see in most of the lectures. I'm going to keep them in. Uh, I, but you won't have to do any clicking, of course, because it's an online section. But I want to talk about the, the questions because they're still valuable. Now, here's one that we usually work on in the first day or so of lecture. It's just a practice question about Chuck Norris concepts. And, of course, the toughest of them all is Bruce Lee, uh, which few students know that. But it's actually a, a true Chuck Norris fact, which even Chuck Norris admits that Bruce Lee was a, a real tough guy. Anyways, here's a regular uh, scientific astronomy question. And this is one that I asked, and I asked both of these in, in the early lectures in uh, spring of 2018. And this is an astronomy question, so let's talk about it. Very simple, from the reading, um, what is the order of the solar system planets? And there's five options. Now, you're not going to have to click on this in a clicker, but you may have a question like this in web courses. I could easily port this question into web courses for homework or a midterm. So let's look at this. Now, the correct answer is D, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the... Uh, you know, different strategies to settle on that because um, in lecture, uh, you can sometimes have to think about things also on midterms in web courses. All right. So, and, and just so you know, this picture is a picture of uh, the Sputnik planum on, uh, on Pluto that was recently recorded just a few years ago. Um, all right. So this option C is uh, no good because Moon's on the list, all right? So if you don't read carefully, you'll miss that. But yeah, moon is not a, a planet, so that one's out. Uh, similarly, E is uh, out because it has moon on the list as well, all right? So you got to read carefully and think. And if you can, as always, if you can eliminate one or two and then make a guess on the, the remaining ones, that will help you out with your... Um, exam performance. So correct answer D and then um, C and E are incorrect. Now the other two A and B are also incorrect uh, and A is incorrect because Pluto is not a planet, not anymore. Uh, also B is uh, incorrect for the same reason. Pluto is not on the list anymore. It got demoted it's now considered a dwarf planet with a few other things that we've seen recently in the solar system. And, and actually, Ceres, uh, we used to think of it as an asteroid as in the asteroid belt, but it's so big, we now consider it a dwarf planet. And there's reasons to separate planets from dwarf planets. Uh, and uh, you know, they decided this about 13, 14 years ago. The, you know, the main body of planetary uh, physicists and, and astronomers. Now, this is a picture from APOD, Astronomy Picture of the Day. And it is, uh, you know, from uh, August 26, 2006. Um, here's the uh, web address. It's really, really good. This is this, what they call the Sombrero Galaxy. And it's a composite image. And just look at that every day. I look at it most days. And you can learn a lot just by looking at the picture. And it usually has a blurb that's, you know, especially by the end of this course, you'll be able to read the blurbs and, and pretty much appreciate uh, everything in the blurb at uh, Astronomy Picture of the Day. All right, here's another question. Now, this one's a calculation. And in, in our online class, we're going to have to do a little bit of calculation. Nothing too fancy. But we will have to do some stuff. Now, this one's Pythagorean theorem. Uh, calculate the length of the hypotenuse. And notice that in this um, slide, I mentioned that 
uh, type in your answer to the nearest whole number. And on uh, exams and homework, I will also do something like that. I'll tell you, all right, I want an answer to the nearest whole number, or I want an answer to the nearest tenth, you know, zero point something, or to the nearest hundredth, you know, something, point something, something. But I'll always uh, specify that for you. Now, this is a fairly basic calculation. You know, Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So 8 squared is 64, 6 squared is 36. The sum of those is 100. So c squared is equal to 100. And uh, to get c itself, you have to square root 100. And that means that c is equal to 10. Now, you'll see questions like this in lecture. I'll keep them in there, even though you're not clicking. And we'll kind of breeze through them, but I want you to study them and uh, use those along with the questions in the textbook and uh, along with the questions in homework and uh, just sharpen up your concepts. All right, let's talk about some of the readings, section 1.3. Um, and this is from chapter one of our textbook. Uh, the rules that determine the motion of stars so far away that your eye cannot see them are the same laws that determine the arc of a baseball after a batter has hit it out of the park. In other words, gravitation. This was the um, great uh, insight of Sir Isaac Newton. And it was, it was actually a risk uh, for him. Not a physical risk, but an intellectual risk. It was a conjecture. And that's because he, prior to his day, and prior to Galileo, most people thought that celestial mechanics, the stars and the planets and stuff, was completely different from terrestrial or mundane uh, mechanics and mundane physics. Uh, but Sir Isaac Newton said, you know what, I think the same force that propels an apple falling out of an apple tree uh, is also the same force that controls the orbit of the moon. And he was able to show that that's the case. Uh, and that's what we call the theory of universal gravitation. And we're going to be studying that in some detail as we go through the next few weeks. And uh, just as a side note, uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, universal gravitation uh, throughout the semester. Because, as I mentioned earlier, for instance, Kepler's third law. Uh, we're going to be using that out the wazoo. We're always making references to it. In general, gravitation is the main force that controls the size and shape of orbits in a solar system or in a galaxy or in a, in a group of galaxies and the universe at large. So uh, it's pretty important. All right, some more comments from section 1.3. Uh, and that is, they made a comment there, the authors, that new experiments and observations can lead to new, more sophisticated models, models that can include new phenomena and laws about their behavior. The general theory of relativity proposed by Albert Einstein is a perfect example of such a transformation uh, that took place about a century ago, back in about 1905 and up to 1915. It led us to predict and eventually to observe a strange new class of objects that astronomers call black holes. Now, the person that I want you to associate with this idea of experiments and observations is Galileo, because he's the one that really got it going. In his day, back in the early 1600s, about the time of uh, Shakespeare, uh, you know, Galileo is down there in Italy professor of mathematics, trying to figure out all the, pro the principles of physics. Uh, and also, uh, he's the one that started um, observing the stars with a telescope. He's the one that started that. They had spy glasses, but nobody used it to look at the stars until Galileo. And he made a lot of progress with that. But what he emphasized uh, in contradiction uh, to, for instance, Aristotle and the followers of Aristotle was that um, you have to be able to measure stuff um, and 
make calculations. He was convinced that the, the grand book of the universe um, that was always open for us to, to look into, to gaze into, uh, was a book that was written in a language uh, that was based on mathematics. So if you're observing the universe, maybe doing experiments, or if it's in astronomy, making observations, because you can't really do experiments with the planet Venus, for instance. Uh, you're, what you're looking for in your measurements is some kind of a pattern. And when you see the pattern in your measurements, which is not always easy, uh, that you can then say, all right, there's some kind of a mathematical rule. And then, you know, you write about that, and that becomes one of the laws of physics. Uh, or like Kepler, you know, discovered his three laws of planetary motion, right? Because there's a different, and, and, and here's a, a, a distinction. The Babylonians and all those guys from ancient Sumer, and Babylon and stuff like that, they and the Egyptians too, they made a lot of observations. You know, they recorded the positions of the stars, the planets, and all that kind of stuff, the sun and the moon, uh, even comets. Uh, very, you know, we still look at their records. Some astronomers like to dig in there and figure out what they were seeing. Uh, but what they did not do was try to set up some kind of mathematical explanation of all that data that they had. And the first ones to do that were Galileo and Kepler and uh, Copernicus as well, as we'll talk about uh, in later chapters. So that's an important thing. Galileo is the one that started that. And he, not only for astronomy, but, but for all the natural sciences, they've got to be measurable. And you're convinced that in your measurements, you will find some kind of a mathematical uh, structure, whether it's some something about, you know, whether it's uh, mapped out in a geometric diagram with circles and right triangles, or something with calculus, which Sir Isaac Newton developed, uh, or some other mathematical principle. And there's a ton of things now. But in the days of Galileo, he's the one that started that off. Uh, so some comments from section 1.5. And as I go through the semester, especially when these new recordings, I'm going to try to emphasize um, the chapters that I'm talking about as I go through uh, so that you have some clear directions about what to read. Okay, so I'll try to be saying section 1.5 or section 7.2 or whatever section that I'm in. And if I don't, make sure you ask for me to do that. For a star, this one's about the speed of light um, in section 1.5. For a star 500 light years away, the light we detect tonight left 500 years ago and is carrying 500 year old news. Now that's actually pretty important because the photons of light that we use as astronomers and physicists, you know, almost everything that we know about the universe at large away from the planet Earth, we know because of light, some form of electromagnetic radiation. Now, all those photons, whether they're X-ray or ultraviolet, infrared or, you know, visible colors uh, or um, uh, microwave or even radio wavelength, uh, those photons, they carry momentum. We think of them as little particles, like little teeny baseballs. And they don't have any mass, but they carry momentum and energy from the star that you're looking at to your telescope and into your retina or onto your photographic film. But they also carry information, and that is an important thing, especially uh, when we start talking about black holes. The theory of information about black holes is very, very, uh, you know, very, very bold and new. Another comment, but what at first may seem a great frustration is actually a tremendous benefit in disguise. You know, in other words, not being able to know the latest. You're, you're looking at something that's old news, but that has an advantage. By looking billions of light years out into space, astronomers, you know, like with Hubble, astronomers are, are actually seeing billions of years into the past. In this way, we can re reconstruct the history of the entire cosmos and get a sense of how it has evolved over time. 
Now this thing over here to the right is a, a diagram called a light cone. And when we talk about black holes at the end of the semester, uh, we'll be talking about light cones. And a light cone is um, the uh, everything that you can see physically has happened in the lower light cone. Everything that you can physically interact with either by light or by you know, physical contact is in the upper light cone. If you're, you know, if you're at the point where those two cones uh, intersect, that you know that's your location in space time, then those two light cones, the past light cone and the future light cone, yeah, they have that description. And when we get to um, uh, black holes, we'll we'll see some really bizarre things with light cones. So the history of the of the universe is readable by you know catching stuff out of light cones in the past you know that, that cone gets bigger and be the, the past light cone you know so we're at the the intersection of those two cones and you know that one in the past you know we can see especially with hubble and the other great telescopes uh, we can see you know way way back into the past and way way far out way way far away so it's pretty important this idea of the speed of light, and we make use of it. And right now we can see almost back to the Big Bang, not quite. And I doubt that we'll ever see all the way back to the Big Bang or, or even close to it. But a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, yeah, we have a fairly good idea of what, um, what we're seeing when we, you know, with the, the right astronomical instruments and observations and stuff sometimes from space we can, we can look way 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 back we'll talk more about that later toward the end of the semester section 1.6 comments all right now this one's important and i, I want to emphasize physical scales here you know a lot of times you'll see in um astronomy books the earth and the moon they won't be the rights they they, they use photographs but they Photoshop them together so that they look like they're right next to each other, but they're not. They're not the same size, they're, and they're not right next to each other. So the distance from Earth to Moon is about 30 times Earth's diameter, 60 radii, 30 diameters. And that's approximately 384,000 kilometers. So that's why it takes, you know, if you listen to the old recordings of the Apollo astronauts, you know, there's a time delay. Same as when you're talking to somebody over a satellite link here on Earth. You know, there's a little time delay because it goes out to the satellite and then back. And for the Apollo astronauts, it had to go a long way before it came back. So the moon's diameter is about 3476 kilometers. So that's about one-fourth the size of Earth, right? Now, so what that means, let's scale this down, okay? If you make the Earth 100 pixels like this diagram here, uh, then the moon is going to be about 25, so that's this smaller one, all right? But the problem with that is this uh, parent distance, as I have my diagram right now, is incorrect. Because if you keep the same scale, 100 pixels for Earth, 25 for the moon, the distance between them has got to be 3,000 pixels. And guess what? Even this long diagonal here, from corner to corner on my diagram in in Keynote, uh, I don't I don't have 3,000 pixels. That's that's not even 1,500. Uh, so let me park these two plant the the two objects at opposite ends there. This diagonal 1,469 pixels approximately. That's not enough. All right, and it's good to remember that because. Um, in your diagrams, do not let diagrams fool you. You have to always, I mean, they're useful, you know, and they don't have to be to scale, uh, but you always should check to see if it is uh, drawn to scale. Now, we can't have a moon of this size and an earth of this size on this keynote slide uh, and have a true distance between them. These are true sizes, but the true distance between them is double this long diagonal plus a little bit more. Now, the distance of Earth to the Sun, forget about it. 200,000 pixels away, that would be. It's 500 light seconds. 
So it's, you know, it's something to be um, alert to. All right. You don't have to always have the, you know, ultra perfect diagram and everything like that. And if and you'll see me set up diagrams. And if you're taking notes and making sketches on your own, which I highly recommend, uh, try to make them as good as you can. And but then, you know, if you want to let the numbers do the talking, you can still have kind of a wobbly or off, you know, off scale diagram as, le as long as you let the numbers do the talking. Like here, you know, I've posted 1469 pixels, not enough. But this diagram will still let me think about um, Earth and Moon and the forces and the orbits and stuff. And, you know, you can do stuff. Uh, so always keep in mind the physical, the relative scales, you know, a light second. That's the distance that light travels in, in one second. It's uh, 300,000 meters, all right? Three times 10 to the eight meters in one second. And it takes 500 seconds to get from the sun to earth, you know, for every uh, drop of sunshine that we get from the sun takes 500 seconds to get here. So, um, you know, so drawing the, the, the solar system to scale, very tough. Uh, drawing the, the earth moon system to scale, very tough. You know, you can do all the numbers and stuff um, and let the numbers do the talking. But if you want to make scale diagrams, sometimes very tough. And forget about the, the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy or even, you know, forget about it. It's way, way, way far away. To ski, you know, everything's little dots, not even, uh, if you try to make something that scale. All right. Uh, so that's all for my lecture today. Um, and uh, you have web courses homework number one running right now. I'll be putting up a few more, but for right now, just homework one. That's due September 13th. And actually, I think I'm going to extend that a little bit um, so you have a little extra time on account of this hurricane fiasco. You know, the hurricane that shut down UCF without even coming within 100 miles of UCF. I'm not unhappy about that, but it did throw us for a loop schedule-wise. So I might extend this a little bit in time, uh, a little bit more time for homework one. And there will be some more, so don't worry about that. We'll have plenty of homework. And plenty of reading. So just keep your eyes open, keep alert, and I'll talk to you in the next lecture.